All right, now it's time for the educational portion of the lunch, what we call SEPs, short educational presentations. Uh, for those of you that have seen TED Talks, this is our effort to imitate that format. Uh, we can't use TED Talks because that's a trademark name. So get used to SEPs because you'll see that at PSP events going forward. To kick it off, we have an awesome speaker. Uh, Andrew Moore is the general manager of strategic accounts for Intel's influencer sales group and the chief of staff for the organization. Part of Andrew's role is around developing the engagements with some of Intel's top end customer accounts worldwide. The goal is to forge strategic and symbiotic relationships with those customers with a clear focus on the progressive use of the latest technologies fashioned to help accelerate their strategies to transform. The other side to Andrew's role is to ensure that the organization runs smoothly, which involves defining and executing strategies for growth, allowing Intel to help solve our customers' most critical business problems. Prior to this role, Andrew ran st strategy and planning where he was responsible for divining, defining and implementing the overall sales strategies to accelerate the drive of Intel's relevance to end customers. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Andrew Moore. Thanks very much indeed. Appreciate that. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Um, somebody said to me in an earlier session, are you from Australia? Um, I had to momentarily pause there and say, yes, I'm from that far northeastern tip of Australia called Edinburgh, Scotland. So it, uh, after having spent 17 years in North America, I'm like, clearly I need to go back to the drawing board and start rolling my R's a little bit more convincingly. So uh, a little bit more about me there. Um, but listen, appreciate the opportunity. Um, thank you for the introduction there. The organization that I represent, we engage with um, large enterprise and government at both state and local level. Um, the engagement style that we have is quite consultative in nature, but essentially what we do is we share best practice on how organizations can take maximum advantage from the early and innovative use of the latest technology with a view to creating some form of competitive differentiation in a market that's changing obviously rapidly around us. Um, I spend the majority of my time with a small subset of those organizations that was referred to earlier as the strategic accounts, and they represent some of the leaders that we see in oil and gas, utilities, automotive, um, financial services, retail, etc. What I try to do there is kind of push the futures net a little bit wider, a little bit longer, look at what's coming down the pipe maybe five plus years from now, and we take the the, uh, the opportunity beyond that of creating competitive differ differentiation to really looking at business and digital transformation. So I want to share with you in the next 10 minutes or so are some, I guess some observations really on some of the things that I see happening globally across industries, the disruptive factors affecting businesses and government, and how they are approaching what I would loosely characterize as the inevitable shift to digital. Um, so if we... Uh, Move the slides a little bit, there we go. So I often use this as my closing slide, um, but I thought I'd bring it up here for a reason, because I think it underscores and amplifies the nature and magnitude of change that's surrounding us right now. You can see uh, up on the top bullet there, by the end of next year, within the next 19 months or so from now, two thirds of global 2000 CEOs will have digital transformation as a cornerstone of their corporate strategy. That's not a bunch of IT problems to fix. Those are profound, disruptive, board-level issues. Um, another one that's kind of interesting is 45% of the companies that were in the Fortune 100 um, 10 years ago aren't there today. And it begs the question, why not? Part of it's because they couldn't change fast enough to avoid being disrupted by somebody nimbler, smaller, and more disruptive than them. Um, the average age of a company used to be 60. By the end of the decade, it'll be 12. So you think about the companies that will be 12 by the end of the decade, they're exemplified by some of the unicorns that we're all familiar with. Uber, Airbnb, Liquid Space, Odesk, Feastly, Kickstarter, etc. If you're a company that's in that former bracket where it's taken you a long time to establish your brand reputation, your go-to-market strategy, etc., 
you should be concerned. How do you respond to something like that and avoid being disrupted? And I think the, one of the other ones that I think is perhaps interesting and worth noting is that, and I know that this is being dealt with by yourselves in the state of California, 50% of the workforce by the end of the decade will be millennials. By their nature, millennials have very different expectations on what work is and what work is not. And what this comes down to, folks, is the ability of an organization, be it a business or a government, to attract, develop, and retain the right talent for the next generation. If you're unable to do that, it is a significant gating factor in your ability to drive any form of digital transformation agenda. The last one that I had there was uh, one that I picked up recently, which is over the next 10 years or so, the work of about 140 million knowledge workers could be replaced by cognitive robotics which is an exciting, but at the same time, terrifying prospect. Um, so what I'm painting here is a picture of um, turbulence, change, disruption, but disruption of a digital nature. So what you see on the screen here are some of the enablers or inhibitors, depending on your point of view, of growth that customers that I talk to globally are wrestling with. Um, the first one that you see there, business efficiency and agility. In other words, um, Save money, respond quickly, because if you don't do it, somebody else will. Likely somebody you've never even heard of before, they will do it better, faster, cheaper than you. If that takes place, you're, you're on the back foot. You're, you've gone from the one that's doing the disrupting to the one that's being disrupted. That's not the side of the coin you want to be on. The second one says data. Um, I have a viewpoint that these days all roads lead to data in some way, shape, or form. It's become the raw material of the information age. But the angle here really is more about Data protection, security, trust, privacy. Um, you know, trust is at the very heart of any organization, be it government or, or businesses, brand identity. You lose that and you lose a lot more than just revenue. The amplification factor there, I think, is because we're all living in this connected world where you've got these 10, 50, 100 billion connected devices. As that takes place, the threat landscape continues to evolve at a terrifying pace. But at the same time, you've got growing issues of things like regulation, compliance, issues like data sovereignty. It's a big, complex, gnarly problem that every company and organization that I talk to is trying to wrestle with. And sadly, there's no such thing as an easy button. I wish there was, um, but uh, you know, it's just not one of those things that you can solve overnight. The third one that I was going to mention is the disruption be being created by the rise of some of these new economy business models, um, best understood by the shared economy, Uber, Airbnb, et cetera, where it's simply based on the premise of having access to something versus actually owning it. And that's creating levels of disruption that I haven't seen in several decades. And it's a completely different business model to the one that has made a lot of the established businesses and governments that I work with successful over the past number of years. So the shared economy is creating disruption. There are several others that are bubbling up at the same time around um, the customer experience, co-creation, uh, the circular economy as well. So they're all creating lots of disruption that businesses are having trouble trying to wrestle with as they move forward. The last one that I had up there was really just the variability that we see in the macroeconomic environment. And that's something we sadly have slightly less control over. Um, what that creates um, is, I would say, an inevitable shift to something that I would call a digital business or an e-government. And it's one of those terms that's used a lot these days, is everybody talks about digital, and yet you ask 10 people, you'll probably get 10 different definitions of what it actually represents. So I'm going to share with you a view on it based on my travels and conversations as to what I think a digital business or an e-government actually is. And there are six attributes, characteristics, tenets to it, if you like. The first one is around being more data-driven. As I said before, all roads lead to it in some way, shape, or form these days. It's become the raw material of the information age. And if you're able to become more of a data-driven business, what it ultimately allows you to do in terms of an outcome is to be able to transform the government or the business with trusted real-time data. So I emphasize the outcome there as opposed to what we, how we'd looked at this in the past, which would have been an IT problem to fix. The conversation is changing here. It's not about the IT problem you're trying to fix. It's about the business outcome you're trying to deliver to the organization. That's number one. Number two is about uh, driving operational excellence and revenue growth via extended insights by being part of the smart world there. Now, what I didn't say in there 
is IoT. Under the covers, there's IoT, but the reason I said it that way is because when, you know, IoT is one of these new shiny objects that we see right now as well, and I see lots of science experiments going on where people throw lots of sensors on a wall and wait for something magical to happen. That tends to be a little bit of an outside-in view. Um, fundamentally, when it comes to something like this, um, if you're not doing it for one of these two reasons, i.e. either driving operational excellence and safety or revenue growth, don't be doing it. So think about what you want to achieve first of all, and then the technology is absolutely there to, to help that uh, come about. So that's number two. Number three is about being on demand. Uh, in other words, uh, be able to deliver features, capabilities, products, services to your citizens, to your, your, your business partners, etc., in record time. So that record time doesn't mean weeks and months. Record time means literally minutes and hours, because as I said before, if you don't do it, somebody else will. Somebody else will do it better, faster, cheaper. Number four is about trust, and like I said earlier, trust is at the very heart of any company's brand identity. And as I've said to the audience earlier this morning, trust is one of those things that's won in drips and lost in buckets. In other words, in other words it takes a long time to develop the trust with the, the person, the business, the citizen, etc. You can go in the blink of an eye. Um, the fifth one is about developing and delivering a properly connected, immersive, but safe experience to your citizens, constituents, small and large business. And that takes you know, an understanding of what do your customers want? What do your citizens actually want? Which goes back to you know, what do you know about them, the data, etc. And as I said before, all roads lead to data. It becomes one of the anchor points of this transition. Um, the last one is about having an innovative workforce, workplace transformation, um, and it really talks to talent. If as a government or a small or large business you're unable to attract, develop, and retain the right talent, it is a gating factor of, for your ability to do any form of this type of transformation. What I would also say is that when you're looking at this type of transformation, don't look at these in silos. What I often see is that, you know, I, I talk about something like this and there's lots of nodding heads and there's a person that says, yep, I'm the infrastructure guy, I'm the security guy or girl, I'm the person that's looking after analytics. Uh, that does not allow you to provide the right level of, of change and transformation. Uh, try to look at these in aggregate. There's a, multi a multiplicative effect. They are all interlinked and tied together. Um, I'm going to leave you with a couple or a few questions to think about. Um, you think about what I've just said in terms of the need to transform. It's not something that's a nice to have. It's nowadays a have to do with velocity. Um, compared to 12, 12 months ago, what have you done differently? And the reason I say that is because I see lots of whiteboards in boardrooms worldwide where we've got bullets to say we need to transform, we need to transform. Have you taken that and actually dumped, some, dumped something real with it? Because if all you do is talk about change and do nothing material to change it, I know how the movie ends, and it's usually not very well. So that's question number one. Question number two, who's driving it? I often find this an interesting conversation. Is it IT? Is it departments? Is it a combination of both? And very importantly, are you on the same page? And I, I say that for a very specific reason, because I did a session with a customer of mine recently where we had the board of executives in the room for three hours. At the end of it, the chief executive stood up and said, it was really insightful, Andrew. You know, clearly you can help us in a material way. It, he also said, we're not on the same page. We've got this nice document in front of us that's calling digital transformation, but everyone looks at it slightly differently. We've got 10 different versions of the truth. So being on the same page is absolutely critical to your ability to move this type of journey forward. Um, the last two here, I talked a little bit about some of the new economy business models. People have read about them in the news, but I often say to customers, have you actually thought about how you would incorporate any or all of them in your plans and agenda for transformation of the government or the business? And then lastly, I know that you're all shifting to become more of an e-government and doing a pretty good job from what I can see. Is there anything that's holding you back, such as, and a lot of often people say, look, technology's my salvation. And I'm like, you know, yes, you, no, it's not. If you, can't, if you can't help the people change, throwing technology at the problem won't make any difference. So are, you, are there barriers around culture, organization, social, political, others that are creating a gating effect in your ability to accelerate your transformation? My time is up. I appreciate greatly the opportunity to address you this, uh, this afternoon, folks. Have a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much.